Catherine Alto is a landscape designer, historian, lecturer, and New York Times bestselling writer. For the past 25 years, her focus has been on places where nature and culture, culture intersect, teaching literature of nature and place, designing gardens, and writing about the natural world. She's the author of two books, the recent Natural World of Winnie the Pooh, a walk through the forest that inspired the Hundred Acre Wood, a People Magazine, Book of the Week, and a feature on national public radio and nature and human intervention. Reviews of her latest book have appeared in newspapers and magazines around the world, including the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, and the Chicago Tribune. Catherine grew up in the San Joaquin Valley of California, surrounded by peach, walnut, and almond orchards. She was educated at University of California at Berkeley, Western Washington University, the London College of Garden and Design, and the University of Bristol. Her career is truly interdisciplinary career, integrating the sciences and the arts, and she is working on her third book. As a writer, she has a special interest in the geography of childhood, literary landscapes, and the public footpaths of England. Please join me in warmly welcoming Mrs. Catherine Alto. Good morning, everyone. How are you? It's lovely to see you all. So I hear there's a bear on campus. Is that right? Have you named it? Well, We're not going to be talking about that bear, although I'm comforted in, in knowing there is a bear around here. <laughs> so we're going to talk about a slightly different uh, bear that you might know. Um, are we going to dim the lights a bit? I love to see your shiny faces this morning. Right. Excellent. I have about 20 minutes to chat with you, so we're going to go rather quickly. But I'm going to take you into, pl into a place you all know in your minds is the Hundred Acre Wood, but most people don't realize that it's a real place that exists today. And I'm in the United States right now. I live in Exeter, England. I am in the United States because this last Friday was the 90th anniversary of arguably the most beloved children's book ever written, Winnie the Pooh. So you probably have your favorite characters, right? Um, and everybody here knows these characters. Um, but I'm going to show you the setting here. So these are the original books published in 1926 and 1928. Uh, A. A. Milne wrote the stories. Um, and I'm going to tell you briefly about the collaboration uh, uh, between A. A. Milne and, and the illustrator, E. H. Shepard, how I came to write the book, and we're going to go into the landscape. So this is, this is the landscape you probably all remember, um, the Hundred Acre Wood. And perhaps some of you remember tracing the footpaths as a six-year-old and thinking that this is a real place that, that, that you could go to. And it turns out it is. Now, I don't normally like to show students beer when I speak, but the book was written in a pub. Uh, in a pub how many of you have been to England? A few of you. I, I thought so. Excellent. Well, pubs are different than American bars. Uh, they're public houses and um, a, a great tradition in England. So this book, The Natural World of Winnie the Pooh, was written in a pub established in 1433, and it's in Ashdown Forest. And I like to show this uh, because uh, people came up to me all the time and they'd see my notes out, and I don't look English, and I don't quite act English, um, which by that I mean sort of contained. Um, and uh, people would say, so what are, you, what are you doing here? What do you do? Um, because the sun would come out and I would rush out and take pictures and so forth. And they'd look at my boots and they'd say, I'd say, they'd say, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm a rider. And they would look at my boots and say, what kind of horse? And that was not exactly the response I wanted. We Americans dull our teeth. So initially there was a little bit of distrust. Um, but I did not want to say that I was writing about Winnie the Pooh. I, as an American associated with Disney, I didn't want people there to think that I was exploiting this landscape. So that was really important to me. Does this look like anything we have in the United States? Probably not. This is the landscape that uh, where A. A. Milne moved in 1925. Um, but it's also the landscape that I first saw when I moved to southern England 10 years ago. So um, I moved there because my husband is a geology professor. He's American. He got a job at the University of Exeter in Devon. And um, we uh, had a beautiful 20-acre, 100-acre wood for our children, who were then three, six, and nine. They then had their American accents. Now they're 13, 16, and 19, and they have English accents. Um, but the book started when my husband got this job. We flew. Uh, 
uh, it's, it's a wonderful theory to live a part of your life abroad, and I hope everyone does, but it's another feeling when you buy one-way tickets to another country and you have no idea when you're coming back. Um, I had no idea when that was going to happen, so I was pretty unhappy actually uh, moving. Um, the second day in moving there, we found a book on public footpaths. Now, of the one, uh, people who raised their hands, how many of you have walked public footpaths in England? Okay, walking there is very different than walking here, where we drive our cars to um, hiking paths and we do, you know, something uh, maybe a, a circular path that's a bit more magnificent. Um, this is a lot different. I can walk from my house in Exeter all the way up to the Hebrides in Scotland just on these public footpaths. So I discovered these and um, I thought I, I can survive. Before the jet lag wore off, we had clocked in about 20 miles of walking on these footpaths. Uh, at the same time, I was reading classic stories to my children um, to ground them in this transatlantic move. I read Mark Twain, lots of picture books, chapter books, including the, the Winnie the Pooh stories. And so this simple image um, struck me. I thought, how am I, how am I going to raise my children in a landscape that looks like Teletubby land? I mean, it really does look like that where I live. And I'm from the vast American West where we have volcanoes and um, charismatic megafauna like grizzlies and wolves and things that could eat you. Um, and it's it's much different, much more storybook in, in, in England. So this really simple image. Um, helped me. So my book started with two simple questions. A New York Times bestseller can start with very, very simple and obvious questions. Is there a hundred acre wood and can we walk there? And that was it. So that's what started. So I have walked all over England and I'm going to show you some pictures of uh, the childhood my children ended up having as Americans. Um, but let's go to the collaborators. Who created the book? This is Alan Alexander Milne, famously known as A.A. A. Milne. He was born in 1882 and he had a wonderful childhood. His father said to him, keep out of doors as much as you can and see all you can of nature. She has the most wonderful exhibition, always open and always free. So as an eight-year-old, he was able to wander 18 miles, 20 miles, and just check in at the end of the day. How many of you were able to do that as an eight-year-old? See, the hands don't go up. I think there was a last generation of, uh, maybe your parents were the last generation who were able to do that. Anyway, the youngest ever Queen's Scholar at Westminster, he went on to Punch Magazine, where he met his collaborator, uh, and I'll get to E.H. Shepard in a moment. Um, long before the Winnie the Pooh stories, uh, he was known around the world as a famous uh, humorist and playwright. Um, and. Um, so if you reread the stories if you, if, uh, before you read my book, but reread the stories and you're going to see that structure is underneath the stories in Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3 with the twist and turn in between the, the acts. And a really dry sense of humor. He wrote like Seinfeld, if you know that dry, clever wordplay. He was kind of the original Seinfeld. He met his collaborator, E.H. Shepard, at Punch Magazine. Um, Shepard had a very different childhood. His mother died when, when he was 11. And so if you look at the images, those classic Shepard images, um, they're very, there's a lot of emotional sensitivity to them. And I say, I think, that uh, that came from um, really being able to put emotions into something very, very seemingly simple. Um, and so he had a, a, a strong emotional intelligence with just very simple pen and ink uh, illustrations. Shepard was the first ever illustrator to get royalties from books. In the past, illustrators were just given, um, they were paid per illustration. So E. H. Shepard was made a very wealthy man with A. A. Milne's generosity. First, first illustrator ever. And this is one of his illustrations. Does anyone know what's happening in this, in this illustration here? What are they playing? I'm kind of curious if you know. Poo sticks. Who said that? Someone in the back. Okay, there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a really complex game, if you don't know. You take a stick, you drop it in the water. Whosoever stick comes out first is the winner. I told you it was complex. Um, so this orig original illustration sold for a few years ago. How much do you think it went for? Half a million? One million? I get everywhere between $10 and $17 million, and it's between those two. <laughs> uh, so it went for 433,000 pounds. So convert that to dollars, about $650,000. Do you think it's a great piece of artwork? That's subjective. I ask a couple of trick questions, and that's one of them. Um, it's certainly a great piece of nostalgia. I think it's a great piece of artwork. So there are other characters as well. Who are the other characters in the stories? ER. Tigger. Tigger Roo. Okay, I'm, I'm hearing them come. 
Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I got it. All right, so we have Winnie the Pooh. You probably all have your favorites. So the original characters were based on Christopher Robin's stuffed animals. How many of you have seen these at the New York Public Library? So they're at the New York Public Library. Okay, the most beloved children's stuffed animals uh, uh, in, in the world, I would say. Who's missing? Owl and, and um, rabbit. They were based on real animals in the landscape, and I'm, I'm going to take you there. And Rue was eaten by a dog and left in an apple orchard, so he's, never, he's not around. Sorry for people who love Rue. <laughs> But they were also, uh, it's, it was a family affair. Christopher Robin uh, is, was a real boy, and this is his mother, Daphne. Um, Daphne created all the personalities. Uh, they were based on um, Christopher Robin's characters, and A.A. Milne remember, was remembering his own childhood, um, watching his son play, and um, using his own writerly imagination to create these seemingly simple stories. Right, so I'm a landscape historian. Let's get to the landscape here. Uh, so this is, it's not located out in the water. Yesterday someone asked me, the arrow looks like it's in the water. I said, no, the forest is on land, <laughs> so they missed that. But it's right about here. Ashdown Forest is uh, a 6,400-acre wildlife preserve, uh, and it's where Milne moved in 1925 because he wanted to give his son the kind of childhood he had. And this is what it looks like. It really does look like a storybook landscape. It's in an area called an AONB, an area of outstanding natural beauty. Uh, it's kind of one step down from a national park. And this is the forest. Does this look like a forest in the American sense of the word? Probably not. But if you look at the etymology of the word forest, a forest is uh, an uncultivated wild tract of land. Um, and uh, it comes from the French, which also uh, was referred to as a royal hunting ground. So William the Conqueror came to England in 1066. Hastings is not far from here, Battle of Hastings, if you know your history. And he snagged this uh, forest from the locals and he said to his brother, you manage it, I get hunting rights here. So it was a royal hunting ground. And this is what it looks like. It's about 60% heathland and 40% woodland and is punctuated by wild Scots pines. And so as a six, eight-year-old and so, so forth, this is where Christopher Robin was able to wander. And the family took long walks here. And this is gorse. Um, it's, uh, it's all over the forest, uh, and it features heavily in some of the stories, especially uh, when, when the bear that we know so well gets uh, some of the thorns in his furry little bum. And this is what the landscape looked like about 100 years ago. Um, do you think it's a beautiful landscape? That's a subjective question. It, it is. It's, uh, it doesn't need to, a landscape doesn't need to be picturesque to be valuable. Um, and it was created this way by these folks. These are called commoners. This is Thomas Friend, and this was taken in about 1898 by a traveling photographer. And Thomas Friend has a, what's called a faggot of wood on his back, which he used for heating. Um, he would have scythed for bracken, he had fishing rights, um, and he also uh, was able to graze his animals there and take topsoil. So imagine commoners worked for the king and the Earl of Delaware. Imagine centuries of these people scraping the landscape down. Um, and they depleted it to make it look like this. Um, so we have, this is dwarf gorse growing there. We have nibblers in the forest uh, who have to, who are brought in by the managers of the forest to nibble down the landscape, to keep it in this um, rare heathland. And then in the background, this is really telling, these are birch trees. And the birch trees are kind of like weeds of the forest and the rangers have to keep it down. What's happening is the landscape is trying to revert to its natural state, which is a woodland. Um, but the 100 acre wood or Winnie the Pooh country is preserved not because everyone around the world has said let's preserve this famous literary landscape but because it's become a rare heathland. It's what you call a plagio climax landscape. That means it's man-made and it has to be man-maintained to make it look like this. Um, and it attracts, it's valuable because it attracts all sorts of rare plants, birds, butterflies and other insects. So Milne, let's, let's look at um, where the stories originated. This is where Milne moved in 1925. It's a uh, medieval English country home, and you can see it was built in three sections over time. Over the centuries, farmers added on to it. And this is a back garden. Uh, how many of you have heard of a little folk band called the Rolling Stones? 
Not too many people have heard of them, right, as I thought. Well, the founder, some of you adults will know, the founder, Brian Jones, died in 19, late 1960s. Um, well, he died in this pool, uh, doing something he probably shouldn't have been doing with drugs. So he went swimming. <laughs> I'm always here to impart such lessons. But he, uh, so in a funny juxt cultural juxtaposition, the founder of the Rolling Stones died in Christopher Robin's pool. Um, so the owners get a funny mix of pilgrims. They get the slightly stoned Rolling Stones fans coming to visit, and then they get the doughy-eyed Winnie the Pooh fans. <laughs> uh, so it's a funny uh, spectrum of people who come to visit. Uh, but the owners are, are wonderful and gracious people, and they're, they're happy to, uh, to chat with anyone. And this is where the story started. Milne was so happy when his son started playing outside. Uh, and they all wrote about this particular tree. And if you know your history, or your trees, um, this is a dying tree. This is an English oak, I'm sorry, English walnut. And any tree with a great gash like this is on its way out. So this was taken in 1925, and the tree came down in 71. But you can see um, how, uh, you know, some of the correlations between the real and imagined places. Um, and I think evolutionarily, it's really important for children, uh, for their development, to build forts and tree houses and so forth, away from the watchful eyes of parents. Um, I'm not quite sure why that's coming up. Uh, yes, so those are, that's where the, the story started, really, in the father watching his son play. So this is the, the painting that sold for so much money. I wanted to show you the original black and white sketch because for 30 years, the story, people, they were a phenomenal success when they came out and people were reacting, children were reacting to uh, very simple sketches. So they weren't colored or painted f until the 1950s. Um, and I do think that children can still enjoy things like that. We'll talk about Disney if someone, well, we won't talk about Disney, let's, <laughs> let's move on. But Disney did something very different to the characters. So if you know Poustik's Bridge and how to play Poustik's, it's played around the world. In fact, my children and I have played in the World Poustik's Championship. Um, so it's a quirky thing in England. But let's, let's go to the real bridge. And I, I like to show this here because this is where, um, this is one of the only signs that you're in Winnie the Pooh country. Um, it's really not built up. And I want to read you quickly a paragraph of what it feels like to be there as an American. So this is me writing about what it feels like and seeing one of the very few signs here. With a population of 2,000, England, uh, sorry, Hartfield has retained authenticity as a charming English village. Ashdown Forest is located south of the village. It is still a place of solitude where people can walk half a day without meeting another person. There are no overt signs pronouncing your arrival in Winnie the Pooh country. There are no bright lights or billboards, no one pound carnival rides, no inflatable Eeyores, owls or roos rising and falling in dramatic flare. There are no signs marking the dirt lane where Milne lived, nor pub grub with names like Milne Mash and Peas or Tigger's Extract of Malt Cocktail on Ice. A quiet authenticity, historical, literary, and environmental, has settled over the landscape. And along the way, there are all these imaginary doors and so forth. Um, and I don't like to tell people exactly where they are, but if you think you're a a serious historian and you enter this landscape, uh, you'll soon um, experience this fusion between the real and imagined places because you have indications that you actually are, you feel like you're walking through an E.H. Shepherd illustration when you're there. So that tree, uh, that door is on a tree stump and people from around the world leave letters to their favorite characters. So here's one from an, ad an adult named Jeffrey. Two piglet, lots of love to you at Easter. Thanks for feeding my inner child. Love and lots of it, Jeffrey. So I imagine he's with his wife and they have a passel of children and he didn't come prepared but his wife whips out a bill envelope and he writes something. Um, so people leave, there's this wonderful pile of letters that build up and they just disintegrate over winter and then build up again. Um, and and people leave pots of honey as well. So if you listen to All Things Considered, Ari Shapiro and I played poo sticks here. So you can listen to it if, if you want and go back, go back in time. And this is what the real bridge looks like. This is probably the most iconic at humble of bridges in the world. And in a case of life imitating art, it's been rebuilt to look like an E.H. Shepherd illustration, which is lovely. Do you know this story? So in this story, uh, it's a different one. Uh, Eeyore's complaining, nobody loves me, but don't worry about it. He's quite a bit of a martyr. Um, so he says to his, his friends, I, my, my house is drafty, it's on the edge of the forest. You, 
One of the things that's so lovely about the stories, um, and you get it especially in this one, is they're written in a dual narrative for adults as well as children. Um, and those, I think it's one of the reasons why these stories that I'm here and we're still talking about Winnie the Pooh at this point, is because they, classic stories, children's stories need to entertain the adults as well as children. And that's what's happening here. Um, so, uh, in a, another reason why they're classic stories is they're wonderful tales of empathy and friendship. So the bear and the pig decide to uh, build a house for their friend, the, the morose donkey. Um, so they go out into uh, the snowy morning and they find what they think is a pile of sticks and they build this house. And then Eeyore discovers it and it turns out that was his house, that pile of sticks, and he's so delighted. It's slapstick comedy, it's really funny. And then the benevolent leader of the forest, Christopher Robin, comes in and says, don't tell him the truth, <laughs> that, that, that you just moved his house from one place to another. Um, but in the real forest, um, people go and build these lovely homes. Um, I don't know if an adult had something to do with this. <laughs> Maybe Jeffrey the letter writer, I don't know. But. Uh, so people go and they're all over the forest and technically they're illegal. You're not supposed to build them, uh, but nobody takes them down. So the last story in the house at Pooh Corner, in real life, Milne is done writing for children. His son is eight. He's saying, I want to go back to playwriting and, and humor and novels. Um, and his son is eight, as I mentioned, and most of the famous quotes about friendship and leaving me and, and will you always stay in this, uh, guard my, my childhood, um, come from this last story. And um, the real place looks, is, is a tree clump. There are eight tree clumps throughout the forest. Um, and as I was writing this, my own children were leaving Exeter, England, where I live, and moving to Exeter, New Hampshire, <laughs> where, they, where they go to school. And so there's this incredible, incredibly sad separation um, that your parents have experienced when you've gone off to school. Um, and what's happening here, it's that, it's that Christopher Robin is thinking, I'm going someplace, I don't know where I'm going. Wherever I'm going, I can't do nothing anymore. So for the first time, he has to ride in between the lines and to have recess. He's just going off to school, really. So I write about 20 of those places that inspired Milne. But the, um, the landscape really, I want to talk a little bit about the flora and fauna, just a couple minutes here. So the reason why the literary landscape is preserved is because it, it attracts rare, especially rare birds. This is a Dartford warbler, and they love the architecture of gorse. They like it about a meter tall with about, with about knee-high length of heather growing. Um, up into the gorse. Um, and there are also these as well. I don't, does anyone know what this is? You will now. It, it is a bird. <laughs> it's not an owl. It's a cuckoo. Some people say it's a cuckoo clock. I say no, it's a cuckoo. I think you're going to know what this is. So cuckoo populations have gone up and down. Shh. You're getting some feedback. They don't have that feedback, but they do have the whirring sound. This is a bird called a nightjar, and it's in the forest in June. It's a nocturnal bird. There, there we go. Much more relaxing without the, that sound. But that is, that's another rare bird. So those three birds that I showed you, their, their populations go up and down and they help preserve the landscape. There are all sorts of other beautiful uh, butterflies, rare birds and butterflies there. And this particular insect is a small red damselfly and it has put a one specific scientific designation from the European Union all the way uh, up, up into England that, pr that protects the landscape. Um, it lights boggy heathland, so the, these particular insects love this area. I have no idea what's going to happen with Brexit, because it is, uh, we're, we're separating from, from Europe and this particular designation, so all throughout England we have to uh, figure out what's going to happen without that protection. All sorts of other wildlife in the forest. I took all the photographs except a few of the, uh, except this one, and um, a few of the, the, the mic macro images of the insects and so forth. But we also have a lot of these creatures too. These people show up. I was doing some research, I thought, and um, came around a corner, and this family shows up. There were four adults in giant tigger onesies. Um, so 
they come to the forest once a year and they read Winnie the Pooh stories. They're not American, they're not German, they're not Japanese, uh, they are English and they read the Winnie the Pooh stories and they have a smack roll of something. Um, so the English do embrace this. Not a lot of people know where it is. But for those who do, it's really important. So this was the guiding image when I uh, moved to England, something very simple from these stories. And um, my children have ended up having a very different childhood than I was scared they wouldn't have that classic American childhood. Um, but we started walking on day two and we haven't stopped. Um, so this is the kind of childhood they've ended up having. Uh, walking on, we've probably walked thousands of miles. Um, and, the, and the rule is when you get to a fork in the road stop, um, you don't want to go any further. So I don't think they were too unhappy. They don't look like this now, and they'd be horrified if you were looking at it. <laughs> They're about uh, 18 and 16 right now. But this is the kind of childhood they've ended up having. A lot of contact with nature, a lot of exploring. I didn't want my children to not experience this sort of wandering. Why are the stories classics? They're classics because we can continue reading meaning into them. I've talked about the structure, um, but also uh, I think some people can read the stories as field guides for the free-range child. Um, you have a, a, a boy wandering a landscape without adults. Um, and it's, like I said, tapped into the zeitgeist of parenting right now. Um, and because a lot of people want our children off digital landscapes a bit more and real time in the natural world. So there are lots of, lots of reasons these books remain popular. Um, I want to end it there because I don't want to go too much over. I hope I've reached about 20 minutes. I'm going to be in three classes today and I'm going to be answering questions later. So you can all say happy birthday to Winnie the Pooh and more appreciation for the bear that's wandering your own campus. Thanks very much.